Welcome to AgriPulse Newsmakers, where we aim to take you to the heart of ag policy. I'm Spencer Chase. Our guest this week is Foreign Agricultural Service Administrator Daniel Whitley, who talks about the department's trip to the Middle East to promote U.S. agriculture. But first, here's this week's headlines. The Senate narrowly voted to confirm Robert Califf for another term as FDA commissioner. The cardiology professor previously served as commissioner during the Obama administration. Califf was confirmed in a 50 to 46 vote with bipartisan opposition over his ties to the pharmaceutical industry, but he also received bipartisan support given his experience in the role. The nation's dairy industry hopes to see Califf take action on the use of terms like milk on plant-based alternatives. Califf committed to study the issue during his confirmation process, but did not guarantee an outcome. As FDA commissioner, Califf will have jurisdiction over about 80% of the nation's food supply. Avocados from Mexico may have been on your screen during the Super Bowl, but they might be a little harder to get into your grocery cart. Federal officials have effectively halted the shipment of Mexican avocados bound for the U.S. until they are satisfied with the working conditions and safety of animal and plant health inspection service employees on the ground. AgriPulse's Bill Thompson reports an APHIS inspector was verbally threatened at a facility south of the border. Mexican government officials say they are working with U.S. leaders to offer the necessary assurances. And finally, the Department of Agriculture is back on the road. Ag Secretary Tom Vilsack and other officials from USDA and across the country are in Dubai for a trade mission to, to the United Arab Emirates. Those on the trip plan to visit with potential customers and attend site visits as well as receive in-depth market briefings on the American export potential in the Middle East. The trip represents the first formal USDA trade mission since November 2019, shortly before the COVID-19 pandemic brought global travel to a screeching halt but American ag goods are still headed for overseas markets. In fact, 2021 set a record with $177 billion in ag exports, a 15% improvement over the previous record set in 2014, according to USDA's figures. When we spoke to FAS Administrator Daniel Whitley, he said booming export figures only underscore the importance of these trips. We have a record year in 2021, $177 billion across a broad range of products. And the reason for the trade mission is quite simple. Our mission is to connect our companies and our exporters to buyers all around the world so we can increase those numbers. And that's what we're doing here. We've got over 40 organizations. Earlier tonight, there were over 200, almost 200 companies represented who were uh, 200 countries represented from around the world interested in buying American agricultural products. So connecting our sellers to all the importers around the world is job number number one for us. Mm -hmm. Why did you feel like, you know, this is the first uh, trip that uh, the USDA's FAS has taken since November 2019. For the resumption of the foreign trade mission, why Dubai and, and why the Middle East? This is an exciting market. This is a growth market for us. Over the last five years, we've averaged $1 billion in exports, but last year we saw a 20% increase, $1.2 billion. There's a lot of demand. There's a lot of interest in growing the trade relationship and importing a broad range of products from the meat complex, grains, tree nuts, you name it, there's interest in growing it here in the region. And so we're excited to be connecting with these customers. What does geographically, what uh, what strategically does the Middle East offer in terms of, of U.S. shipments to, to that region? I mean, because I, I have to imagine uh, there it's not exactly as developed as a market as something like a Japan or a South Korea might be, some places where agricultural products from the U.S. have been going for quite a while. Right, you're absolutely correct. Uh, obviously, this is a high income area of the world. The tourism, there's a lot of diversity in the region. So it gives us an opportunity to export a broad range of products. The taste and appetites are various and numerous across the board. So we can send a lot of product here. There's a lot of demand, particularly in the hotel, restaurant, industry sectors, and we do well in that space. We can outcompete anybody when the playing field is level. And we just know that this is a market that is set up for future growth, and we want to play in this market in a big, big way. When you walk into the room as, as a representative of the United States of America and seeking to sell U.S. ag goods overseas, I guess whether you're in the Middle East or, or elsewhere, what, what, what do foreign buyers want to know from you? You know, interestingly enough, one of the first questions we always get 
is our reliability, our ability to supply the market on a consistent basis. And we do that better than anybody else. If you just look at the record exports last year, that was the time of the pandemic. That was during supply chain logistics. There were other headwinds that our ag exporters faced, yet behind it all, we still reached a record level. So we've proven to the world that we can be a reliable supplier of agricultural products, both when times are great, also when times are a bit more troublesome. So you and your colleagues are in Dubai right now. Uh, if, if, if you have your druthers, obviously the pandemic is going to play a big role in, in, in your future travel plans. But, uh, but if we're letting you uh, spin the globe and, and point somewhere, where, where are you headed next? Well, I can't point to just one place. I got to point to a few different people. So give me a chance, a few different places. Of course, Let me spin yes. It a couple of times. All right. We think the Southeast region is very attractive. That's an high growth potential, growing middle class consumers, growing population, growing GDP, a uh, lot of taste and preferences similar to the West. And we think we play well in that area. So I wouldn't be surprised to see us try and do something in Southeast Asia at some point later this year. Also, Africa region of great interest. Many of our competitors are there, but we're hearing there's more interest and demand for American ag products. So we want to get into that market and build relationships and build new pipelines of agricultural products there. And also we've got the two pending FTAs from uh, last year with Kenya and the UK. And we think at some point our ag industries would want to get there and explore those markets. So there's a few places where we think it might make sense to have more trade missions this year. We'll be right back with more from Administrator Whitley, including where to get the best brisket in Dubai. Farm Credit supports rural communities and agriculture with reliable, consistent credit and financial services in good times and bad. We provide loans to farmers and ranchers, farmer-owned cooperatives, rural homebuyers, agribusinesses, and rural infrastructure providers. As cooperatives, we're locally owned and governed. We help agricultural producers feed the world. For America's farmers, Farm Credit supporting rural communities and agriculture. Learn more today. Welcome back. There's been plenty of conversation in the U.S. about supply chain issues getting products to producers, but some of those same supply chain issues are also causing problems getting U.S. ag exports out. Administrator Whitley says those issues do come up in his conversations with overseas buyers, but overall, the reputation of U.S. ag goods remains strong. I think we showed we were reliable uh, provider of safe, nutritious, and timely food and agricultural products. And in a time that we're in now where there's a lot of uncertainty for a number of different reasons, importers are looking for reliable suppliers. So we think that we're in a very, very crucial time to where we can expand our footprint, grow exports, and show new customers that we can be a reliable supplier for them as well. Here in the United States, we hear so much about the, the issue of the empty shipping containers leaving, leaving West Coast ports to get back to other countries. We've seen legislation introduced on Capitol Hill to try and deal with that issue. Are those issues, those conversations coming up in your, in your, in your dialogue with, uh, with your colleagues? Yeah, we, we get asked about that, but what, what I, the way I think about it is, I think the administration's task force on the supply chain logistics disruptions have shown some results early on, and we're hopeful that results will be coming in. Hopefully in the next, I don't know, quarter, Q3, Q4, we'll see these, uh, these problems behind us, and we'll hopefully be back to business as usual and getting these products out, uh, having access to containers, and getting these products to customers on time. So we talked a little bit earlier about the the geographies that you'd like to to go next, but I, I have to imagine different parts of the world have different requests in terms of what they're looking for from from the American producer. As you kind of look globally, what do you think are some of the U.S. ag exports that are that are perhaps most poised for for near term growth? Yeah, no, I think that's a very good question. Obviously, we see a lot of growth in the middle class around the world. We know one of the first things they do when they reach middle class is improve their diets through higher quality protein. I would not be surprised to see a lot in the meat complex, beef, pork, and poultry, dairy commodities. Also, we see consumers start to prefer more fresh fruits and vegetables. We're competitive in that arena. I would not be surprised at all to see our exports of those commodities grow up. 
uh, grow over uh, over the next few years. And then tree nuts, I think, is a big area. But as always, the bulk commodities dominate, and we've been doing a lot of business with soybeans and corn and wheat. So it's really just a story of America being a supplier of a diverse range of products, and we can do well every year across the board. So a lot of times when trade dialogues take place, there's always that issue of the American production practices and the, the, the acceptance perhaps or perhaps lack thereof uh, within, uh, within our, some foreign countries. You're in Dubai right now. How, have there been, has that been brought up at all, the, these American production practices and perhaps issues getting products into foreign markets as a result? Yeah, so what I've heard uh, since I've been here this week is that there's an acknowledgement and an appreciation for the food safety system in the United States. There's an acknowledgement and an appreciation for our regulatory system. And folks are interested and want to be educated and want to collaborate with us increasingly on how we produce food. They're very interested in our efforts in sustainability. Obviously, we've got the Aim for Climate Ministry coming up. That will give us a, a, a big platform to talk more about that. But a lot of countries want to know how we're going to be approaching sustainability, what our producers are already doing, how they can collaborate and learn from our ag industry. So we think we're in a leadership position to educate the world on sustainable agriculture and meet that new demand. The, the, uh, the sustainability efforts of the American producer, how well are those understood, do you think, uh, amongst, uh, amongst foreign buyers? I think we have room to educate foreign buyers. I really, really do. I've been educating myself over the last six to eight months on what's going on in the dairy sector, what's going on in the soybean sector, what the cotton industry is doing. I was absolutely pleasantly surprised at all of the efforts already underway by American agriculture to produce commodities sustainable. I really do believe we're going to be the global lead in sustainability and the role that agriculture can play in fighting some of these climate change challenges. Last question is going to be perhaps the most difficult one because it might put you on a bit of a spot with uh, with some of your hosts. I want to know the best meal you've had so far in Dubai. Oh my gosh! Listen, that's easy. So uh, there was this 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 chef who traveled to Texas to do a pitmaster apprenticeship, and he moved back to Dubai and opened up his own barbecue restaurant sourcing U.S. beef. And I had some of the best brisket in the world at this restaurant the other night. And by far, so far, it's the it's the best meal I've had. And I say this gentleman is a pit master. He is a pit master. The only certified chef who can cook over live fire in the Middle East. And he's that good and that talented. So uh, barbecue brisket uh, here in the Middle East, from a chef who was trained in Texas is the best meal I've had. A touch of America in the Middle East. Who would have, who would have thought? <laughs> FAS Administrator Daniel there Whitley joining us from Dubai. We appreciate the time, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our thanks again to Administrator Whitley for joining us from Dubai. We'll be back with more AgriPulse newsmakers, but first, our Hannah Pegel takes a look at this week's Map It Out. The Biden administration has committed to dramatically reducing greenhouse gases and sees cover crops as a way agriculture can help make that happen. But let's face it, cover crops don't work everywhere. In dry areas like the western United States, cover crops can pose a challenge as they compete for water with cash crops. For this week's Map It Out, we look at where farmers planted 14.3 million acres of cover crops in 2021, according to USDA. It's easy to see how farmers weren't interested in planting cover crops in some of the drier parts of farm country, especially where irrigation was not available. The dark blue indicates areas with 10,000 plus acres of cover crops, and then the gray areas indicate zero. You can see cover crops are most popular in the eastern parts of the Dakotas, the Corn Belt, and the Texas Panhandle. The Build Back Better spending package included $27 billion in new conservation program funding, but that bill got stuck in the Senate. Part of that legislation would have paid farmers and landowners money for each acre of cover crops they planted. Legislative efforts to encourage cover crops may have stalled, but look for the Biden administration to incentivize their growth through USDA programs. To, to receive our special report on cover crops or a copy of this map, please send an email to newsmakers at agripulse.com. For this week's Map It Out, I'm Hannah Pegel. 
Farmers are always there for each other. We shed tears together, we celebrate together, but we also grow together. Farm Bureau is the largest general farm organization in the country. We have the farmers back. If you're a farmer and you're not a member, we would welcome you into our Farm Bureau family. And if you want to know more about agriculture, come be part of this great family. Welcome back to AgriPulse Newsmakers. Join now for a panel discussion featuring a panel of agribusiness experts really looking forward to the perspectives they will bring on farm policy and particular this week on trade policy. And, and we'll bring in our panelists now, joined this week by Michael Dykes with the International Dairy Foods Association, Kent Backus with the Nat National Cattlemen's Beef Association, and Ann McMillan with Invariant. Appreciate all of you taking the time to join us. And, and Michael, I want to go to you first. Uh, we had the chance to talk to Administrator Whitley uh, for this program just about uh, kind of generically the importance of trade, the importance of engagement, and the importance of, of working with international customers. Wondering, Michael, if, if you could just kind of shed some additional light on how that engagement has worked, how that has shown benefits in, in your role at IDFA. Well, trade uh, is extremely important to IDFA and our members uh, manufacture and export. Uh, about 90% of the milk produced in this country uh, goes through our members. It's either consumed domestically uh, or about 16% of it is exported. We're exporting more dairy products than we are consuming in food milk in the U.S. for the first time ever. So. Exports are extremely important to us. We're pleased to see this administration work aggressively as one example that uh, Administrator Whitley mentioned with the Canadians on the uh, USMCA uh, panel and the uh, a positive decision they got from the panel. So we're looking forward to this administration working aggressively on that to make sure that uh, uh, we are able to get dairy products uh, into Canada for the first time in, in many ways. Uh, through the TRQ administration. So we're working closely with USTR. We're pleased to see them take the action. We're now waiting to make sure that the final outcome results in more dairy products uh, entering that marketplace up there. So uh, exports are ex extremely important to us and growing more so as we look to more milk uh, being produced in the U.S. So obviously dairy is so, uh, so uh, crit exports so critical for the dairy industry, but for the beef industry as well. And and Kent, I know, I know a lot of your work at NCBA involves building those relationships and, and having those conversations with foreign buyers, as well as folks like the U.S. Meat Export Federation uh, also involved in efforts like that. But I, I suppose it changes a little on a country by country basis. But if you're, if you're starting from sort of a, a square one standpoint, trying to build a relationship with a trading partner, how long of a process are, 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 are we looking at before there's you know, general acceptance of U.S. practices and U.S. product? Well, I think it's important to realize that anytime you're uh, developing a presence in a, another market, you're looking for the long-term investment. And so, you know, for us, uh, we, we're starting to see kind of the fruit of those labors over the last decade. And so, you know, when you look at Korea, look at Japan, and even China, we've really had to, to earn the trust of those consumers and build a presence there. But because of that, now they are, you know, $2 billion markets for us. And starting off, it wasn't that easy, but it does take time. We have to, to not only work with our governments to you know, address some of these tariff and non-tariff trade barriers, but we also have to work with our partners at U.S. Meat Export Federation and otherwise to, to di connect directly with those consumers. Uh, but we are seeing very positive benefits because of that investment. When the first, the, in the first instances, when you're talking with a new trading partner, what, what generally do they want to know? Well, I think the first thing they want to do is they, they want to assure the safety of the product. You know, they, they want to not only know the product, they want to know the people behind it. And so that, that really is uh, why we have to focus on, on earning their trust. And, and for us, it means explaining our production practices. You know, we have a very science-based approach uh, to how we uh, produce high-quality beef. Uh, but in other countries, it's, it's not a common practice. So really, we have to help educate them on why we use science on on how it not only addresses animal health and food safety, but also improves the animal welfare and the sustainability footprint. And so that's a long-term education process, but, but really uh, that just drives home, you know, how important uh, all of these practices are, and it helps us build that trust with consumers. And I want to bring you into the fold here because we've talked a little bit with the, with the producer groups, with the commodity groups here on the panel about the, the process of building the trust abroad for U.S. product. But trade has always been a bit of a, a dicey political issue here at home. 
And you know, we, we in particular we saw in leading up to the 2016 election, the the Trans-Pacific Partnership was such a hot button political issue in that race. I, I wonder is if from the the chair that you're sitting in is is trade getting uh, more difficult to sell uh, domestically here in the United States? Oh gosh, I think that's. What I would say is that trade is very different um, than maybe we left it in 2015 or t during the last um, trade promotion authority or the last big trade agreement that we that unfortunately didn't get across the finish line, which is TPP, as you mentioned. Since then, we had the last administration, which had a very specific view on trade, um, a, a slightly chaotic one, I think. And then you had the passage of USMCA, which really... I think change the dynamics on how trade agreements are considered in Congress. And so you sort of take those two items together and now we're in a much different place um, politically in Washington. And I think you've seen this administration say that they are gonna sort of pump the brakes um, at least at the beginning um, and really focus on domestic market issues and then turn their eye to international markets, which is probably the right thing to do to let some tensions and emotions cool uh, on trade. Um, sorry, not not the other cool on trade. Um, just uh, and then um, and and see what is in the realm of possible moving forward because I think the dynamics have changed extraordinarily since 2016. We'll be right back with more from our panel after this. It takes a seed to grow. That simple idea inspires and informs the team at marketing, communications, and consulting agency, Curious Plot. Our 2022 Seed to Succeed Pro Bono Grant Program will offer $75,000 worth of in-kind services to a nonprofit organization in the agriculture, food, or animal care markets. Organization nominations are accepted until close of business on March 18th. Learn more at curiousplot.agency. Welcome back. We spoke with our panel about the role of the midterm elections and the broader U.S. political landscape and trade policy. Here's more. Well, let's take this conversation to Capitol Hill now, because Kent, I, I know NCBA has, has been pushing uh, for the consideration of Trade Promotion Authority, which is, of course, uh, for, for those that might not know, that allows for trade agreements to come to Capitol Hill for a straight up or down vote. Uh, but uh, it, that, that authority has lapsed now, and, and wondering what is NCBA's approach and the approach, uh, the approach of the farm groups more generally to the fact that, that we're looking at a lapsed trade promotion authority? Well, I think, you know, we have, a, we have many members of Congress who weren't here when TPA was authorized the first time. So it, it is an education process. Uh, you know, it, it, we do have to uh, underscore the importance of, of TPA. Uh, TPA is never a, uh, it's never, you know, a, a bill that passes with a wide majority. It's usually pretty close because, you know, trade oftentimes is misunderstood. But it's a, this is a vital tool. It's, it's critically important to, to make sure that, that Congress and this administration or any future administration are aligned on what our trade goals are and what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, it's very important from, <clears throat> and it's from an SPS standard, but also just making sure that we're able to go out and send a clear message to all of our, our trade partners that our trade negotiators are negotiating in good faith. And they have the backing, the full backing of the government and also to make sure that, you know, when a deal is secured, that Congress can't, you know, turn it into something it wasn't meant to be. So, you know, TPA, it's going to be an important tool. We need Congress to re-engage. We need the Biden administration to re-engage on TPA, on having these important discussions, because we need the United States to lead in trade policy once again. Well, and Anne, as, as we were discussing earlier, you know, the trade is a very different political animal right now. And of course, we, everything that is being done in Washington, being done through the lens of the fact that there is a midterm election in November. After that, uh, we're going to be looking down the barrel of another presidential election headed up, coming up here in 2024. Wondering how you think all of that, uh, that political background factors into the current landscape, the current conversation around the possibility of considering trade promotion authority. I think it makes it particularly difficult to renew trade promotion authority this year, um, especially with the administration not asking for it. And I think one of the reasons we're not, they're not asking for it is there isn't, they understand that it's gonna be a, a very contentious discussion. Um, also, they don't have a trade agreement on the books yet. I think there's acknowledgement that they're working on an Indo-Pacific trade framework. Um, and whether that turns into a, you know, a full-blown trade agreement is, is yet to be seen, but, um, you know, I, I, it's just hard to believe that the administration would start down that path 
understanding how contentious it is in a midterm election year. Well, and, and now bringing Michael back into the to the discussion here, you know, to, to Anne's point that she made earlier, the administration focusing a little bit more on some domestic uh, domestic economic issues before diving headfirst necessarily into those international markets. But if, if given your druthers, if you had the ear of U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai and President Joe Biden right now, your uh, IDFA's uh, market wish list of, of places you would like the administration to to prioritize finding an agreement? Well, to me, it's, it's straightforward. We have to have trade. Trade's extremely important. Uh, we, as our American producers, are the most efficient, uh, sustainable producers in the world. We have to have trade agreements. One of the reasons we had record trade exports this year was because of the trade agreements that have been done in the past. And U.S. industry, U.S. exporters have to have a level playing field on tariffs if we're going to be able to compete. Uh, the, the U.S. is the third dairy exporter in the world. Uh, I firmly believe we can become the world's dominant supplier of dairy products, but we have to have trade agreements. I think it starts with asking for TPA. I agree with Ann. Uh, we've got a, a tremendous educational challenge ahead of us, uh, but and I agree with Kent, we got many new members, but we got to educate them on the value and the importance of trade. Uh, Agriculture is the only part uh, of our trade balance that, that contributes to, uh, that's a positive trade balance, uh, meaning we export more than import. So it's extremely important. We need to be started now on trade agreements so that, that uh, people can get the benefits of those one year, five years, 10 years from now. Uh, not being in CPTPP uh, will continue to put us at a disadvantage as countries that are part of that see reduced tariffs year over year when we aren't a participant, when we don't get the value of that. So uh, it's important that we negotiate these trade agreements and that we get into tariff reductions and we move beyond the framework. So my wish list, ask for TPA, do the educational outreach to both parties on Capitol Hill, get it passed and begin to negotiate trade agreements. Let's get with the U UK, let's get with these Asian countries, let's, let's go take the high ground and let's get the agreements put in place so that we can compete on a level playing field. Well, a great discussion, and I hate to cut it off, but I think that's all the time we have for today. So, Ann, Kent, and Michael, thanks for joining us. Our thanks to this week's panel. We'll be right back with more AgriPulse newsmakers, but first, our Hannah Pagel takes a look at this week's featured farmhand. Fred Clark recently retired from his role as Chief Counsel for the Republican staff on the Senate Ag Committee. In his career, he has not only worked on seven farm bills, but he has also spent time on the staff for both Democrats and Republicans and the House and Senate Ag Committees. Fred and I sat down to discuss how the farm bill has changed over the course of his career and which one was the most challenging to get across the finish line. Fred also offers advice on what he thinks staffers should know when they begin to write the next farm bill. Take a look. You know, the best advice is to read and understand the programs in the bill. Um, it's amazing how much you can learn if you just read them. Um, and then of course, being familiar with the people who, and the industries who the bill impacts or uh, is designed to help. Because that's really what the bill's about is helping you know, people who are on food stamps or farmers who need farm program or people who buy crop insurance, producers, whatever. Um, understanding the needs of those people will drive what, how you need to think about creative solutions to whatever those issues might be. To learn more about Fred's career and how he got into agriculture policy, head to agripulse.com. Join us for the 2022 AgriPulse Ag and Food Policy Summit. Speakers will discuss the groundwork for the next Farm Bill on March 21st at the National Press Club and through our virtual experience. Register today under the Events tab at agripulse.com. Agriculture Future of America is a nonprofit building transformational leaders in food and agriculture. AFA prepares college students to join the workforce as innovative and engaged young professionals who will shape the future of agriculture. Head to agfuture.org to find out how you can get involved. Thanks again for joining us for this week's AgriPulse Newsmakers. Before we let you go, here's what's on the horizon this next week. It's a long weekend with the House and Senate both scheduled to be out of session next week. 
The Department of Agriculture will host its annual Ag Outlook Forum Thursday and Friday with a long lineup of speakers set to appear in a virtual format. The event also serves as USDA's release of its official projections for the upcoming growing season. Across the country, industry leaders will gather for the National Ethanol Conference hosted by the Renewable Fuels Association and the Frozen Food Convention hosted by the American Frozen Food Institute in Dallas. As always, stay tuned to agripulse.com for the latest. For Agripulse Newsmakers, I'm Spencer Chase. Have a good one. Newsmakers is a production of Agripulse Communications. For more ag policy news, visit agripulse.com. You can also find our new content on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to follow Agripulse and our correspondents on social media to get breaking news and more.